our recording now. Um, and we will be posting um, the event later. So um, if you would not like to appear, just remember to keep your camera off. Um, so my name is Megan Armstrong Abrami, and I'm an associate professor of Hispanic linguistics at UMass Amherst. I study um, child language development, um, but first and foremost, I'm a mom. Um, I'm also one of the co-owners of the Without a Village um, Instagram account, along with Amanda Richard Scott, which is an account focusing on the challenges of parenting in a culture where we are often, uh, very often, village less. Um, so a few months ago, not long after Amanda and I had created that account, um, I had reached out to Dr. Narvaez, and um, it was my first semester uh, back from leave after having my daughter um, at a time where I was especially up in arms about the enormous mismatch between the way I wanted to be present for my daughter and the restrictions created by the society that we live in. Um, and to, in addition to these restrictions, I was thinking a lot about the way responsive parenting is actually discouraged. Um, not just in society as a whole, but um, in our families, from the people who are closest to us, our, our relatives, our partners, et cetera. And what a tremendous hurdle that is for mothers to face on top of all the other challenges um, that we face in our lives. So I contacted Dr. Narvaez because in reading her work and familiarizing myself with her projects, I saw that she was a scholar who believes that we can change our culture. Um, and I found that really exciting. So I'm grateful for her um, for being here today and being so extremely generous with her time. Um, before I introduce her to you, I just wanted to say um, that in your registration, you were able to include any questions you had for her. So we'll be, we have a list of those questions. And so she'll be addressing some of those in the PowerPoint that she gives. Um, and then we'll be looking for ones that, that maybe weren't in there and, and having her address those as well. Um, since we're a large group, only the host will be unmuted. Um, but if you have a follow-up question, please do put that in the chat. Um, and Mary Tarsha, a doctoral student um, of Dr. Navaez's, will be um, working, uh, will be moderating the chat. Um, and I'm just going to take a quick second to plug her work as well, because it's also very exciting. So she focuses on how early life facilitates or not the biosocial construction of well-being and socio-morality, um, specifically the mechanisms of, of action by which the evolved developmental niche or evolved nest promotes human flourishing and peaceable children, families, and societies. So definitely keep Mary Tarsha on your radar because she is an up and coming scholar in this area. Um, and we're excited to have her with us. And so that's a great segue to introduce um, Darsha now. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Darsha Narvaez to you today. She is Professor Emerita in the Department of Psychology at the University of Notre Dame. Her research explores questions of species typical and species atypical development in terms of well being, morality, and sustainable wisdom. And she looks at how early life experience, the evolved nest, influences moral functioning and well being in both children and adults. She integrates evolutionary, anthropological, neurobiological, clinical, developmental, and education sciences in her work. So, truly intersectional. Um, she has asked many questions, but I think relevant to what we're talking about today, um, she's asked questions like, how does early experience shape human nature? How can educators and parents foster optimal development, well-being, and communal imagination? And her work highlights the fact that, and I took this from an abstract from um, one of her more recent papers, I thought it was really nice, that modern industrialized societies often do not provide humanity's evolved nest, thereby undermining optimal normal development in their citizens. And I think that statement really captures why many of us are here today. Um, she is the author of numerous journal articles and books, including uh, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom, which was the winner of the William James Book Award and the inaugural Expanded Reason Award. She's also the current president of the award-winning venerable nonprofit Kindred World. Um, and then a uh, outreach project of Kindred World is the Evolve Nest Initiative. Um, and it's a nonprofit mission to share her science research into developing appropriate baselines for lifelong human wellness by meeting the biological needs of infants. And don't worry, um, everything I've mentioned, we're gonna be sending you out links later on so that you can have access to all of those. The Evolve Nest, I need to tell you, is an amazing resource. I find new things on it um, all the time. The book reviews I just discovered today are amazing. So um, we'll send you links for those, definitely check them out. And um, also she was recently named a fellow of, of AAAS, um, American Association for the Advance, Advancement of Science. Um, and I think those of us in the co-sleeping, attachment parenting, bed sharing online communities are 
some of us are familiar with her um, blog on psychology today called Moral Landscapes. Um, so that's probably within, within the online community, we see that a lot, but as you can see, her work reaches far beyond that. Um, so we are so happy to have her here with us. And thank you again for being with us, um, Dr. Navais. And without fur further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Megan, for organizing this, for inviting me and for your kind introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be with you today. I'm gonna to share a PowerPoint. Uh, as the questions came in, I kept adding more and more slides to it. So <laughs> I hope you're okay with that. We'll share the PowerPoint with you later. We're recording this. So you can have a, a reviewing of it later on. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I entitled this, What Do Babies Need? Because uh, there's certainly a lot of misunderstanding about this. And I uh, first want to say, though, that my overall view, as Megan has pointed out, is this is my <laughs> research question, essentially, <laughs> for all my work. What's gone wrong with humanity? And how do we change course? So uh, I fit, uh, I mean, that's of obviously transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. And so I do a lot of uh, integration across fields. And one of the aspects of this then is uh, I examine uh, bottom-up experiences. So early life experiences, how that shapes then the child's psychosocial neurobiology, how that affects who the adult is, their beingness, their morality. And then their uh, cultural beliefs that they implement in the culture and uh, what they do to meet early, uh, how they provide for early life experiences and basic needs. So I'm looking at all these levels, which means you have to look at uh, our history as a species, our anthropology, all the different ways people meet early life experiences and what childhoods look like and what children look like uh, in these different kinds of contexts and how the adults behave and the kind of morality they exhibit and the cultural beliefs and practices, the stories they tell uh, and how that affects this cycle, right? And we have a film, six minute film, you can uh, watch breakingthecyclefilm.org. I think Mary will put it in the chat, the link, uh, which talks about the different cycles that we're in the, not the best cycle at the moment. All right, so let's start. What is a baby? We, people, a lot, a lot of people, most people don't know that babies resemble fetuses until 18 to 20 month, months of age. That means their the bones haven't solidified, their uh, different aspects of the body don't look like uh, newborns of other animals. And so a lot of things is, are happening after birth. In fact, our human nature is shaped after birth. So if you don't provide for, uh, if you raise a wolf child, that child is missing, uh, that means, um, they're raised by wolves, which some children have been uh, found to be in the past, uh, you, you find that they're missing a lot of the human characteristics, but they're not quite a wolf either, right? So they're missing that postnatal shaping of well-being and personality, their confidence, uh, their sociality, their intelligences of all kinds are shaped during this time. So we really have a high plasticity or malleability or moldability uh, at a neurobiological level, psychologically and socially in these first five years. And it just decreases over time throughout life how plastic we are. So it's really important to pay attention to those first uh, days, months, uh, years, because there are sensitive and critical periods for development of various systems. So the stress response is setting itself up depending on how, how frequently and how uh, exacerbated the child's stress is. They're going to have a different set of parameters than a child who's kept calm all the time. So their personalities are going to be different and their ability to self-control and self-regulate uh, is too. So babies uh, evolved to expect nested care, evolved nest, which I'll mention later. We've got tons of uh, podcasts, videos, and essays on this at evolvednest.org. And this nested care then meets all the basic needs the baby brings, which I'll mention later. And 
So the baby's expecting what our ancestors adapted to, what helped them survive, what helped them thrive, what helped them succeed across generations. So, and this is for uh, 6 million years, humans, the human genus has been around. So the testing of the nest has been going on for multiple generations, maybe 80, <laughs> uh, 80 million years uh, or 80 million generations. It's kind of crazy to think that there's an experiment that can say, oh no, you don't need to do that. <laughs> it's already been around for 6 million years or longer. So. Uh, early life stress, then we know now more and more and more people are paying attention to this, how, because we're able, we have uh, neuro uh, developmental science now these days, and we can look into what happens when a baby, an infant is stressed. Now we know, we know that early life stress is toxic. We didn't know this a hundred years ago. And so people making decisions about what baby, how babies should be treated, you know, they didn't really have much evidence for it. it was much more driven by ideology, uh, by adult ideas of, you know, just keep that baby out of my, out of my way. <laughs> I can say more. Anyway, I can say tons more about everything, but I better move along. So what are the sources of biases against babies' needs? It's just uh, apparent that we don't think much of babies, the way we treat them. There's various strands that have led to this outcome the move to settled agriculture about 10,000 years ago started to diminish care for babies, uh, replacing what we call the nested companionship care. They needed more children uh, to uh, work in the fields, but then they were less healthy. You can see in the archeological and other evidence that uh, the health went down, epidemics went up and so on. We also have religious justifications that came about in the last couple millennia, uh, ideas that babies are born with original sin. Uh, look, they cry. <laughs> oh, they're so sinful. They want their needs met. <laughs> right. Um, and then there's the takeover of the common lands, especially in the last 1,000 years in Europe. And then that was brought to the Americas, which led to lots of disruptions in populations and homelessness and starvation and emigration. So we had a lot of people coming to the United States without their extended families. And we know that grandparents are the ones who evolved to raise kids in particular to help moms. Uh, we wouldn't be here as a species without grandmothers. And, and so we lost the wise elders and the support systems when people came to the United States uh, because of all the disruptions in Europe primarily. And then mothers without support would take, uh, took up unhealthy practices. Nobody knew what to do, right? So they fed their young babies oatmeal, for example, and babies were dying. And so the Academy of Pediatrics was started with formula preparations that wouldn't kill babies. <laughs> and uh, over time, then uh, the view was that, uh, you know, the scientists know better than moms, right? And they tried to science, scientificize mothering with all sorts of expert books in the last hundred years or so. And um, so that's been going on. At the same time, in the last few hundred years, the in Europe, adult male thinking, uh, male bachelor of philosophers kind of uh, decided what humans were like. And it's mostly about reasoning and thinking and who cares about bodies, who cares about needs, women and children. Eh, you know, they're not as important as, you know, our thinker, our ivory tower thinkers of, who are bachelors primarily. And so this idea that we're morally, more, more human because of how we think and reason took over, has taken over. And so our schools focus on reading, you know, and thinking that way and, and diminish all this embodied intelligence that otherwise grows as a part of humanity. And a lot of that is our heart-centeredness, our ability to integrate our emotions and our thinking and our social uh, responsiveness to others into a way of being with others. And then we have millennia of child mistreatment. Uh, Lloyd de Maus has uh, documented this across European history, a lot of punishment and, and tying up kids outside like dogs. Uh, and so there's traumatized adults have been just been passing on their trauma. We know that happens. Parents do that. If they haven't resolved their trauma, they pass it to their children. And that's been going on for centuries. 
And then Western science comes in with its experimentation and it establishes its principles based on these species atypical patterns, right? So with the artificial food being fed to babies in the early 20th century, and then the separate sleeping that came about also from European things, um, then that was established as normal for babies, whereas both are abnormal and um, inappropriate most of the time. So what's happened in our, uh, what's happened in our, um, I'm gonna hide this, hopefully, well, I can't hide it for me at the top. Uh, so anyway, our culture has trumped biology and evolution. In uh, Ian Sati's term, US has a taboo on tenderness. And he, he says that leads to all sorts of psychological problems. We know it also leads to physiological problems, all the health uh, that we're, we're at the bottom of every, every uh, assessment of well-being for adults or for children that the world organizations do, UNICEF and others. US is usually at the bottom with the United Kingdom because our cultures are very similar. And uh, we can see then that we have this kind of misunderstanding going on. John Bowlby wrote this, although the overriding need of an infant and child for love and security is now well known, there are some who protest against it. They say, why should an infant make such demands? Why can't he be satisfied with less care and attention? How can we arrange things so that parents have an easier time? And you know that there are a lot of books <laughs> that are still saying that and having the same attitude, right? He goes on to say, in the meanwhile, we should be wise to respect the baby's needs and to realize that to deny them is often to generate in him powerful forces of libidinal, which means affectionate attachment, demand, and propensity to hatred, which can later cause great difficulties for both him and us. So that's where it gets then to the social level, the societal level that also interests me because my area is moral development. And uh, so we have a society in the US that's falling apart in part, I believe, because of how we've undercared for our children. So, let's see if we can go on here. so the evolved nest that we write about and study, Mary and I, is based in converging evidence across multiple sciences. So evolutionary, ethology, just study of animals and animal development, ethnography, neuroscience, clinical and developmental sciences. It, the evolved nest is conserved for over 70 million years. It's been around because we're part of the social mammal line. Our genus has been in existence for two million, I'm sorry, six million years and Homo sapiens sapiens for about two million. And because humans are born so immature um, and the development's happening mostly postnatally, as I mentioned, the evolved nest really acts like an external womb then. It meets the needs of the child immediately to keep the brain chemistry optimal because when that baby gets distressed, the brain chemistry is destructive to the brain. Babies then require this nested companionship care to grow optimally. And I'm counting babies zero to three, zero to two and a half years to three years. Uh, of course, we all need nest, nestedness throughout our lives. So uh, this is, uh, but we're focused in on babies here because it's particularly important then. The evolved nest then prioritizes babies' well being for the long term and its effects on society. So any move away from evolved nest practices is a risk factor. And you've got to show me the effects of something that's not evolved nest a practice. You have to show me that it has no ill effects across time, across the lifespan of that individual in multiple variables, right? So how many studies do you see that violate the evolved nest that actually show us there's no long-term risk to well-being? And Darsha, just to yeah. clarify, yes. the, the, what the evolved nest is that ecological system of care that optimizes child development, right? So we'll go, you can go to the website that's in the link that I put in the chat for a more of a description of the nest. But what Darsha is saying here is that there is converging evidence from all of these disciplines, as well as from 70 million years that shows this type of care 
optimizes child development and the way that you care for the infant and particularly in how you care for them at night when they're sleeping is part of that. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so there, I'm gonna to get to the evolved nest components in a moment, but uh, there's kind of two ways of being, it seems, uh, that we can map out here in terms of parenting, in terms of how adults view children. The nested companionship orientation, which is found all over the world, uh, been our practice as a species forever, <laughs> virtually, uh, is guided by a sense of abundance. There's enough for everyone, right? We are here together. All needs are welcomed and everyone can get their needs met and needs change and so you're responsive to those changed needs. And you're really invited as Mary was talking about this with her own uh, mothering, uh, you're invited to creative engagement. Uh, needs then are varied uh, by age, by individual, and there's an understanding that young children need more and they need, you know, to, to have the community, the mom, the dad, the grandparents to meet those needs. And an understanding that child has an inner compass of growth and development. They are unfolding before us. So just stay out of the way, right? Provide what's needed and stay out of the way. And then this uh, sense of security in an attached relationship. We are here together, right? So there's no worry about um, being detached or, uh, well, you try not to be, of course. And then you're flexibly and relationally attuned with a growth mindset that, you know, everyone's on their path to growing into your, their humanity. And you're responding to needs as they arise. You're focused on a lifelong outcomes, generational benefits benefits, intergenerational benefits. The other side is the one we see mostly around us now is guided by a scarcity mindset that's kind of me against you. Is it parents or kids needs, right? Shouldn't parents be in control? Uh, so that's, I see that as the bias in a lot of these papers and research paradigms where they're trying to show that it doesn't matter if you leave babies to cry, doesn't matter if you feed them formula instead of breast milk. And they're trying to show, oh, it's okay, uh, and so it's in effect, everyone's needs are being suppressed. The mom, the dad's, uh, the baby's needs can't really be fully met because there's not enough, right? And so there's a limited satisfaction and the parent is controlling the child's development. They're, they're rather inflexible about that. They wanna coerce the child to particular the ideals that they have. They really have an insecure relationships, detached. Uh, usually this means there's unresolved, unhealed aspects in the parent from their own childhood, uh, which hopefully you repair before you have children. And then they, they operate from a fixed anxious mindset, uh, justifying rigidity, justifying the suppression of children's needs, minimizing those needs, focusing on immediate gratification to get you know, something fixed. Uh, and attraction to um, research that shows you a quick fix, quick fix, right? So it's a very different orientations. Mary, you wanna say something more? Yeah, so what Darsh is explaining here are basically two different ways of engaging in family life and the ways that we, different ways that we see our children's needs. And so, we can all understand and really identify that the one on the right hand side this is kind of the dominant narrative that we hear a lot within our culture but there is another way <laughs> uh, that's the left hand side this is this nested companionship and so it's really seeing and viewing needs of infants and children as an invitation to help them develop right so rather than trying to control and guide them to a particular behavioral outcome it's it's very reciprocal and so needs are continually changing as they grow and so it is this open-hearted hearted way of relating to children thank you so we uh see in a lot of the literature that's uh, pro sleep training, pro leaving uh, babies alone, pro uh, growing babies and forcing them into independence. Uh, you have to do that and teach them to be independent. Is they, they focus on experiments, but you really can't do proper experiments on human babies. It's unethical to randomly assign them to particular treatment. We're going to give you this mother who's going to breastfeed you for so long and this other mother who's not. 
and you randomly select the mothers and children. You can't really do that. And anything really significant that you measure is really hard. Every baby is developing at their own rate. And every few minutes is a different baby because thousands of synapses, uh, brain connections are growing every moment in that baby's brain. And so you cannot separate out experience from growth, uh, it, except if you isolate the baby and then you look at what's happening. And we've done that with animal studies. So you can do animal studies on the kinds of things that we, uh, are important to us as human beings because we're mammals too. Uh, and you can see that when the mammal babies separated, bad things happen. Things get disrupted, breathing, heart rate, uh, immune system, uh, and their long-term effects that you may not see immediately because the brain adapts, you know, temporarily tries to adapt to the gaps in the brain. But over time, then they, like a foundation of a house, if you miss the pillar, <laughs> it maybe it won't matter for a while, but when that storm comes, oopsie, right? So it is possible to, to create poorly constructed experiments and pretty much virtually all the ones I've seen that support sleep training are these, are poorly constructed. They're not designed well. They have poor monitoring of what's happening, uh, not blinded. So the people know, what, uh, the experiment knows what, who's in which group. Uh, they're not controlled. They don't have a, a control group where they know what they're doing. And so they, they also use this intent to treat model or method and used a lot in medicine where you tell one group what to do and you don't tell this other group what to do. And then you, you don't measure what they really did, but you, you pick a variable and then you see if they're different. And uh, this is pretty, would be rejected in psychology <laughs> because you don't know how faithful the people were to the intervention you suggested and you don't know, maybe the other people did other things. And besides, uh, anyway, so, um, so virtually every study as well lacks a baseline for what's normal for the species. They don't pay attention to the fact that we're mammals. Mammals need to be held and touched virtually all the time. And they just assume that yeah, it's like out of nothing. You know, We don't know whether it's good to have breast milk or formula. We don't know whether it's good to breathe oxygen or not. It's crazy, right? It's uh, the, you know, the, the, the baselines are missing. So our species nest provides appropriate baselines proven over millions of years. And uh, a few experiments really can't compete with millions of years of testing. So the evolved nest is, uh, invo has these nine components that we study. Uh, and these are found all over the world, primarily um, well, throughout our history. And when I speak to uh, the world audiences, uh, everyone except for Europeans and North Americans nod their heads and say, yeah, 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 we know all that. And it's the North Americans and Europeans that say, what? <laughs> so it's this Western culture that somehow has gotten twisted away from our normal species typical way of raising children. So you can see there's soothing perinatal experiences. These are gonna affect uh, the child for the long term. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these, we could go hours and hours on these. Uh, and I'm not uh, presenting that information. I'm just sort of giving you a snapshot of where we are and what, what to pay attention to. Breastfeeding, uh, then positive touch, moving touch, really important. So when you sleep train or when you isolate the baby in their own bed, you are now violating that principle. Uh, positive climate, so welcoming climate to that child. So they feel like they belong, they're, they're wanted. Again, if you isolate them, if you sleep train them, you are violating this principle. Self-directed social play uh, with multiple age playmates, allo mothers. So this is not all on mom. This is a village of care <laughs> nest. And it's uh, usually grandmother uh, in our heritage but also fathers and others. And then responsive relationships, really important to meet the needs of the child in the moment, especially a baby, keeping baby, babies calm. So the biochemistry is appropriate for growth, really important. So sleep training violates this principle as well. Nature connection, nature immersion, in the wild nature, ideally building a sense of attachment to the ecological landscape around you, and then nine healing practices for things that go wrong or get out of balance. And we do that routinely, right? We, our relationships go awry or we feel down 
So we need routine healing practices to keep us balanced and in our open-minded, open-heartedness. So these are uh, wellness-informed then practices, uh, and it's this, uh, all species have a nest. And as I, we've said, it's, ours is over 70 million years old, and so on. I think I've said all that. So anything, uh, Mary, or that you want to add? I'm just putting some links in the chat uh, that give for more information as uh, you talk, Darsha. So if um, other people want to check that out. Okay, and remember, you can save the chat. If you click on those three dots down at the bottom where you can write a comment. Uh, you can say save chat and it'll have it for you at the end. Could I just right. ask something, Darsha? I, just yes. because one of, the, um, one of the questions related to your previous slide yeah. Um, about experiments on babies. Um, and one of the questions was, um, especially with books like um, Emily Astor's Crib Sheet, for example, um, where she's pulling these numerous studies and saying, it doesn't matter if you sleep train, it doesn't matter if you do this, it doesn't matter if you do that. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if you could just go a little further um, in terms of the work that people do believe proves um, that something like crying it out is okay. Well, I was going to go through a oh. uh, list of things that compares the two approaches, right? So parenting by experiment really is what Oster's promoting and uh, evolved nest companionship then is the kind of parenting that uh, is our evolved heritage. So I can, I'll have more to say, I think, too. Let's see if I answer the question. Um, and you can bring it up again otherwise. So the evolved nest companionship, we've got 70 million years of uh, experimentation, really. Uh, and it's, uh, the evidence is coming from multiple sciences. The scope is broad. It optimizes survival and thriving and well-being. The length of study <laughs> of the evolved nest is millions of years. And the outcomes of concern are holistic effects on child well being over the lifetime and across generations. The baseline is that you want to trust nurturing your nurturing instincts that are, have developed over these millions of years. And the bias is towards child and adult well being in peaceful societies. The quality of studies are across disciplines uh, with lots of different publications. On the other side, the parenting by experiment has been happening for less than 100 years. There are a handful of people that conduct a handful of studies, I may be exaggerating there, that are typically not replicated by other researchers. This is a major problem in, in medical research. It's also a problem in psychological research, the replication crisis, it's called. So most studies are not being replicated. So that, that means there's a problem with the design, there's a problem with the interpretation, there's a problem with, uh, how the statistics were run or what information was provided in the um, publication. And what, what we see is the scope is very narrow for these uh, research studies. It's usually the literature is uh, even funding, being funded by uh, or um, tied to making money from. And a lot of the sleep training uh, publications that I've seen have people who make money from a sleep clinic uh, or they're getting funding from who, who benefits from having uh, sleep training? Crib companies, uh, formula companies like that too, because it's hard to breastfeed when you do these things, right? And the American Academy of Pediatrics is funded by these folks. And so these trade organizations, like there's American Sleep Council or whatever it is, these are trade organizations that are promoting, uh, making money from these things. So you have to be careful about who's funding the research. Uh, the length of study then in these cases are, are usually days or months, uh, not millions of years. And they're looking at one or two outcomes, tangential generally, short time period. They're not focused on child holistic well being. They have no baseline, right? And they, uh, the, the orientation is that you want to coerce and manipulate children into independence for their own good. There's just a basic assumption in these last, this last 100 years about that, probably 150 
in terms of discourse. Uh, and then the biases are not mentioned. They don't tell you explicitly, but you can see that they're biased towards adult control. They're biased towards minimizing the needs of babies. And there's, like I said, multiple flaws in design. And I, we've gotten written about a few of these and complained to the Pediatrics Journal for very flawed uh, publications and said it's very unethical. Uh, so that's happening. So how do you... Uh, evaluate a research study. You've got to have a broad scope uh, understanding of science. So it, that's where Evolve Nest helps you see the broad list of things of sciences that are related to human outcomes. It's not just this one study that's going to tell you what to do, right? Uh, and then understand that experimental studies of a rapidly developing baby isn't going to give you a lot of information. Uh, isolating variables, um, and it's hard to apply to real life where every child is unique, dependent on relationships, dependent on your care 24 seven and all the interactions that ensue. And so it's really important to ask how the researcher, researchers are using the tools of science. Do they have skin in the game? Are they gonna make money? Is their reputation dependent on this? Is their group or their funder uh, going to be impacted? And do the conclusions fit with our species history? our species needs, our species development, our known clinical outcomes. And a lot of Oster's work just pays no attention to this, right? She pays no attention to the, the shoddiness of some of the research uh, studies she cites, um, which is uh, distressing because she's supposed to be a research <laughs> economist, right? But she's not very good at paying attention to what, how well the study's been done. And so this is a big problem right now. And do the results of the study examine the long-term outcomes across years, and this means into adolescence and adulthood, in terms of multiple health outcomes? This is not what I see. I have not seen a study like that. And I think when we talk to parents, we need to say, do the results of this study that this person's citing, do they fit with your heart of heart instincts for what is best for your child? If you look at a parenting can I, book, can I yes, say one go ahead. Thing? Yeah, so when we're talking about looking at the outcomes, so one of the limitations of empirical studies is that they have to select a limited number of outcomes. And um, some of those outcomes are really important, but as a parent, right, you want to um, emphasize and build the development of the whole person. So you're not interested in just a lack of depression in your child. You're not interested just in a lack of psychopathology. You're interested in their wellness uh, across every domain. And so that is just one limitation of empirical research. And so when Darsh is talking about looking out the outcomes, you know, it's important to look at, you know, what exactly do you want for your child? It's not simply just one small outcome. Yeah, thank you. So when you analyze a parenting book, you have to look at the credibility of the author. Do they have a deep understanding of child development? Emily Oster does not. What biases does the author have and are they made explicit? No, she doesn't make those explicit. I'm just gonna be honest about it. What baselines does the author adopt? Are they explicit? And do these fit with our species history need development and known clinical outcomes? Not in her material. And does the author provide enough specific details for the study references so you can actually draw your own conclusions if you go find those studies? She doesn't do that, in, uh, at least in crib sheet. And is there converging evidence from a broad science perspective for the findings? Nope. And do the author's conclusions fit then again, with our species history needs and clinical outcomes. No, no, they don't. So what is it that we want to establish as baselines? Our wellness informed pathway. What is that? That's where we meet basic needs. We foster thriving through meeting those needs. We develop a heart mindedness, this full way of being a human being central to virtually every society around the world that the European, recent European mindset has dropped essentially. And then we, that also leads to an earth-centered living know-how, which if you've been paying attention, the planet is under duress in every sense of the word. And we have, we're kind of failing at this. So the, um, the viewpoint then here is that you need to meet basic needs. And I think everyone's familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. These, 
it goes in this direction. It turns out though, uh, there's another way to look at it. So they're in a circle and that all of them need to be met. It's not a hierarchy. And actually for babies, there is no hierarchy. They need all of this at the same time, physiological needs, feeling safe, like they belong, that you're building their self-esteem and they can self-actualize and grow into their unique, beautiful selves. So our basic needs are complex. There's lots of them. They're animal needs. And unfortunately, a lot of adults forget that we have more than animal needs, right? Nourishment, warmth, protection. Say, that's enough, you know, put the baby in their own room, their crib and go off and, you know, uh, do your own thing. But no, we need affection pretty much 24 seven, play, inclusion of social mammal needs of bonding and support and enjoyment. And then as we grow, many more needs. So what we want then in the wellness informed pathways to meet basic needs that promote thriving and healing, they integrate body, mind, spirit, and heart. And then it promotes a know-how for compassionate and a regenerative life. And this is the cycle then of connected companionship, cooperative connected companionship. Companionship from, the, from conception, leading to good health in children and adults and communities that attend to the basic needs and keep the cycle going. So going against our species baseline is risky and researchers should assume that evolved nest practices that are against the norm should be, uh, uh, well, that any, Sorry, I said it wrong. So any practice that goes against the evolved nest should be considered a risk. So trauma-inducing pathway is really what we're on. We don't meet basic needs. We promote ill-being. We underdevelop uh, body, mind, heart, spirit. And we have a lack of know-how for a connected, regenerative life. And what happens then physiologically here is we undermine, we malform our stress response in that baby. You can see the brain size of an extremely neglected child on the right, a three-year-old, uh, this across sectional of the brain and the normal size of the brain. Now this is extreme there in the picture, but every time you undermine the needs of the child, you are uh, potentially creating a gap in the brain. It's not gonna grow if the cortisol levels are high from crying it out sleep training, that actually when they get too high will melt synapses and will melt those connections in the brain and so you'll be you know just not fully your uh, you won't reach your full potential so all these things get in this are malformed and that really is spoiling the child in my view I you could say ruining right the neurobiology of the child uh, because they're sensitive periods there's no way to repair them uh, not always but uh, we don't know enough uh, about what things um, can be repaired in adulthood. And so there's a lot of uh, dangerous assumptions promoting baby independence. They're really all unscientific beliefs here. Forcing babies into independent sleeping is good for them, increases health and well being, uh, puts the baby on a road toward healthy physical outcomes, ensuring good sleep patterns. No, no, this is early toxic stress. Yes, sleeping is important, but there's other ways to do it, right? And there's um, that's where the challenges come in in the, in the society where there's very little support for parents. And making babies learn to settle themselves at night helps them establish self-regulatory skills. Not really. The child just shuts down their growth. It maybe helps them with emotional well-being. Now increases distrust of self and others and the world. Oh, it ensures children's ability to control themselves and establish self-reliance. Now promotes insecurity and dependence over the long term. Uh, and this is what we know from uh, studies of co-sleeping, for example, are much better at promoting security and independence. And it's really the adults here that are promoting their own independence and detachment from the baby, unfortunately. So what we're in now is this cycle of destructive competitive detachment. We've got social poverty at every level, under care of babies, dysregulated children, adults who are Ill, have ill being and limited social moral capacities, and it's a trauma inducing culture. Adults are distracted, overwhelmed, neglectful, controlling, over controlling, and they're just, you know, money making is more important. And uh, anyway, so we're in this cycle at the moment. So what I recommend is everyone get this book. It's got it's really wonderful, Safe Infant Sleep by Jim McKenna. And here's a list of uh, studies that he uh, where he um, uh, mentions the short and long term 
benefits of childhood co-sleeping rather than sleep training, right? And uh, so people can, I think it would be great for discussion groups. We have a lot of blog posts on sleeping that I've done with experts in the area. And the mantras I think we need to say to others when they say, oh, you don't pick up the baby, you'll spoil it to say, my baby is still a fetus until 21 months old. So my baby needs an external womb experience. Or when they say, I'll leave the baby to cry, stressing a baby undermines brain development. It's toxic. Or why are you paying attention to the baby? <laughs> Babies know what they need, so listen and comply. Oh, why are you being uh, spoiling your child that way? I wanna optimize my child's holistic well-being. And why are you not following what uh, this book tells you to do and leave your baby to sleep train or whatever? The evolved nest was tested over millions of years. Show me the experiment that violates the evolved nest that shows no ill effects into adulthood. So that's it. <laughs> I've got my, got, I'm getting off my soapbox now so you guys can uh, ask more questions. Hey, thank you. Um, so I wonder if anyone has, we have we have a list of questions also from things people asked in the registration, um, but I you can also ask follow-up questions um, based on the, the presentation that we just saw. And so I think there- um, Megan, I just sent you one that was sent to me, so- Okay, I can read it, sure. Um, so this one says, <clears throat> excuse me, my husband and I didn't submit a question in advance, but if there's time, not already covered, we'd love to hear any guidance or advice Darsha has on how to practically implement this approach with a three month old who has trouble sleeping out of our arms, curious her thoughts on safe sleep, co-sleeping, et cetera. Well, as I mentioned briefly, in not too much detail, uh, we, are, we evolved to be pretty much on in, arms or on bodies 24 seven as babies, right? So we're fetuses. So remember your baby's like a fetus. And so it's um, vital that somehow you make sure they know you're right there. And that, you know, how you do that as a family, you know, it's all different and varies depending on what tools you have available. Ideally you are doing safe bed sharing and you're able then if that baby, you know, Babies get scared different times and are growing and have growth spurt at, spurts at different times. And sometimes they need to just sleep on your chest as a result, or they're fighting something off, some uh, infection. So I think you just have to be responsive to the child. If you have the, if you're privileged enough to have a lifestyle or an income level that you can actually stop <laughs> and pay attention to the baby for the first two years, especially, uh, and uh, devote yourself to that not alone in isolation with other people, but um, that baby, you'll benefit forever on that. The health of baby will be better than a child who's left alone uh, a lot. But um, I can't speak to specifics, really. And also just to view yeah. those, um, you know, your child is having a need. And so to respond to that, um, rather than, you know, trying to suppress that need, your, your child is not, the infant is not trying to be selfish, or there's nothing, you know, wrong or evil with that child by needing to be close to you and sleep, sleep on you. So that's, I think, important to keep note of. My daughter, my 13 month old daughter is co sleeping on my husband right now, if that's makes anyone feel good. <laughs> Any other follow-ups um, from Darsha's presentation? Or we can also move into some of the questions that people had in the registration. Um, so one, one issue I'll bring up, um, we all know that the AAP does not recommend bed sharing. Um, and um, if you look at online groups um, where you can go for support for co-sleeping, um, there are countless 
post in these groups um, about advice from pediatricians making specific recommendations to sleep train children. So going to the doctor and hearing that advice, you need to sleep train your child at this point. Um, and this is often because um, doctors will tell you that at a certain age that children are supposed to sleep through the night. Um, so this question asks, can you brief briefly describe what sleep training entails and why so many doctors push the practice? Um, how much training do pediatricians re receive in medical school with respect to sleep? Um, and where do they get these ideas? Well, first, nobody sleeps through the night. We all wake up periodically. We just don't, we forget it. We don't remember it. We're not aware. Uh, but babies do wake up more often and they should because they're learning to breathe. <laughs> it's really hard to breathe. You know, they're used to having the placenta and the umbilical cord do bring the oxygen to them. They've got to switch the, the way the diaphragm works to breathe with lungs. And some of them forget to breathe. In uh, Jim McKenna's book, he's got case studies in the back talking about parents who are bed sharing safely with their baby. And they suddenly wake up, they have some warning dream and they, they look at their baby or feel the baby and the baby's blue or cold because the baby stopped breathing. Uh, and, and so they're there and they shake the baby or you know, rock the baby to, and the baby comes back uh, to breathing. Uh, so I think it's really important to, to understand what a baby again is, a fetus. Uh, in the uh, pediatricians, um, my colleague uh, who's a child development specialist says, they don't know anything. <laughs> they don't know anything about child development. Now they read their journal. So we complained a number of years ago uh, about a journal article uh, with sleep training. Uh, it was co-authored by a sleep training clinic person making money from this. <clears throat> and the abstract declared with no evidence in the study that was presented that sleep training was safe for all children. I won't go into the de de details of the study, but that was extremely unethical. But the, th the point is that doctors only read those abstracts they don't know any better. They don't know how to read the research probably. They don't have time. They're reading the abstracts. Oh, it's safe. And then the word gets around, it's safe, safe, safe. Now it's really important to sleep. They get good sleep, right? And so I think the doctors are paying attention to that aspect of health. It's really important, but they have dismissed be safe bed sharing, which is what everybody all over the world pretty much does. At least 90% of people around the world, according to Jim McKenna. And uh, so there are ways to do that, but the doctors don't know that. Just like the obstetricians don't know what a natural birth looks like. They're never, they've never seen one. So they assume whatever they've had practice and they were taught is normal. And the same thing's happening here. So the norms, baselines for what, uh, what's good for a child are just assumed to be whatever I learned. We call this shifted baselines. Uh, it's happened all over the place. In, uh, in sciences where people think whatever the oceans, for example, were like when I was a kid, that's normal. But then you miss that they're getting worse and worse over time. Uh, and so that's the same thing that's happened in psychology and medicine is we forgot what thriving looks like. I didn't talk about that. You can look at our other material on what thriving looks like. We don't even know anymore. We're content to just, you know, not, not die, I guess, not get too sick. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if I answered all the questions. Let's see, looking at the questions. So they don't know very much about things. Why are they, oh yeah, why are they uh, promoting this? Well, their, their trade group, again, remember it's a self-interested group. The American Academy of Pediatrics has, gets money from crib companies and formula companies and keeping babies separate from parents instead of a safe bed sharing promotes profits for both of those uh, industries. <clears throat> so follow the money, but follow your instincts, really. Thank you. I, I think that James McKenna's book should be in every pediatrician's office. Um, so the next question um, I'm going to ask from the list is one incredible obstacle for women who are breastfeeding, chest feeding people. Um, is the very short leaves um, that employers provide, especially in the US, um, which just clearly do not support 
um, attached parenting practices. And many women choose to sleep train, not because they want to, but because they don't have any other solutions um, to balance their career and their family. So what advice would you have for these women? Well, it depends on the age of the child, right? So <clears throat> um, what I had written, I wrote notes on some of the questions. <clears throat> what I had written was find someone who can live with you, who can sleep with the child, right? Safely or be there. So you don't have to do the sleep training if it's a young baby. Now, if it's a three-year-old, that's a little different, right? They're, they're able to uh, you know, take into account what you're saying and they can have, their, have a lot of other ways to support themselves. But a baby, baby doesn't know what's going on. They go into the abyss of despair and they're you know, falling into hell really for them if you leave them alone to cry. Uh, and, and so there has to be some way to uh, address not despairing your child because now you've shifted their health trajectory to be less than optimal. So I recommend for women who can do it, for families who can do it, to just uh, stop your career temporarily or want less, work less, so that you do have time to, to sleep with that child to safely, uh, to care for the child in the 24 seven involved nest way. Uh, now it, it's really impossible for some poor uh, families or single parents. Uh, and so you have to somehow bring your, uh, make your own community, your own village to try to address these issues. It's just uh, deplorable how, what we do to families today. Mary, do you want to add anything? Yes, I think there's a comment from Donna Anderson, and I think it's great. We need to find a way to support the infant and the mom together as one. So yes. well said. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think we have to mobilize our communities to actually be for children and families, and that's going to take a movement. Uh, and get me on board. Uh, every community needs to to really move on this. And I think another big point that we talk and write about is also the importance of flexibility in the work schedule for parents. And so this is also something that we promote and there's other ideas of how we can promote this across the board in our society. That's really important. That way parents have the flexibility to be able to care for the children and infants needs in the moment and as well as balancing uh, work. Someone asked about um, the, how the Industrial Revolution, or pointed out uh, that the Industrial Revolution changed people's sleep schedules. Uh, and that's true, right? That to make us try to sleep eight hours straight through, and that's not our, our normal species way of sleeping. You usually have four hour chunks uh, and you wake up in the middle. And in our non-industrialized communities, you walk around, you go have some tea or something. Now this is without lights on though, this is no electricity. So you're not interfering the melatonin production that would happen happens at night, which is really important for health in various ways. Uh, so if you're gonna try to mimic the pre-industrial way, uh, then you know, get up and go to the rocking chair, the child, you know, and uh, listen to music or uh, walk in the moonlight or something, uh, but don't turn the light on. That's the thing that will stop melatonin production for 90 minutes, and uh, you don't want that to happen. There's a, a question in the chat. Um, why are pediatricians not doing this in support of and advocacy of their patients? Well, you could ask that for a bunch of different uh, advisory things, they, the advice they give. Uh, not scientifically uh, founded, right? This is not scientifically founded that babies should sleep alone or that sleep training is appropriate. Not good science, um, <clears throat> but they are, you know, they're uh, subject to cultural um, pressures in their fields like everybody is in their fields. So, and they don't have enough knowledge to counter it. So you have to find the people who are paying attention to the big science across fields, who are, you know, no, they, they're explicit about what their assumptions are, what their baselines are. So that's what I tell people. My assumption is that we should follow what's been proven, proven or tested by evolution for 
what, millions of years, at least 70 million years. And that's a better baseline than to not have any baseline and throw up, uh, throw everything in the air and see what comes down. So um, yeah, pediatricians need more education and they're overwhelmed with all sorts of things uh, distracting them just like everybody else. And I would also say, you know, um, try to find a pediatrician who has that open mindset to learn from you. So it's a relationship and a collaboration. And so, you know, as parents and as mothers and, and fathers, there's so much wisdom there. And so they can also learn and having that reciprocal relationship and communication is very important. Someone asked about um, how to maintain consistently responsive caregiving when the infant will settle only with one of the caregivers, um, usually the mom, uh, and not the other one. And so I, it, it matters how old the, this child is, but uh, usually infants know who's responsive or not, you know, so make sure everyone's learning to be responsive to the infant and they'll be more attentive to the responsive people. But also you can uh, use smell to help you. So wear mom's shirt, you know, when you hold a baby or something, cause it's smell, the mom, uh, the baby knows mom's smell for nine months and longer, right? Uh, well, maybe not nine months, but in the womb. But um, so anyway, that's just one suggestion. I was gonna, I, it's in the questions um, generally, but, um, I think in that vein, what can we do when not all caregivers support this way of thinking when our, you know, mothers and aunts or partners are saying, you're going to spoil this child, you need to teach them to be independent, you can't keep picking them up. Um, what do you suggest for, for dealing with that? Well, I suggest not talking to them. <laughs> Uh, you just have to focus on the baby and not what people are saying, right? Uh, so your baby tells you what what the baby needs. And so just be responsive to baby and, and you have to shut them out for a while. Uh, and then if they could watch, you know, when babies are well nurtured and we see this around the world, they're so cooperative and independent. And when they're, you know, four years old, they're so amazingly different than the child's children who have been, uh, whose needs have been minimized. Uh, so they'll see that over time, that your child isn't all spoiled and uh, dependent, unlike some kids who maybe they raised <laughs> in the way they're talking about. Yes, and just to add to that, I think it's important to, um, you know, summarizing everything that Darsha has said is that when we're looking at development, we're talking about different trajectories. And so the first few years of life, as she said over and over, and as the science reiterates over and over, are so critical for what type of trajectory you're putting your child on. And so those first few years are very intensive, but it's elevating your child's trajectory and optimizing it. So it can be hard work um, in the first years if there's not a lot of support around, but it's so worth it, right, in the long term. And as Darsha is saying, even at three and four years, you can really see the difference. There's a suggestion here for the question. I was my response to um, when a child is an infant is oriented to one caregiver and not another. Um, this uh, Donna said, try skin to skin. Yep, that's absolutely the way to do it. So if it's the father, they they don't feel as close to. Father can do skin to skin caring and holding for you know however. Uh, long and that will bond the ch the father to the child, but also the child to the to the father. So skin to skin is a wonderful uh, uh, just method. Everyone should have skin to skin all uh, you know regularly. <laughs> so uh, here's another question on insights on the benefits of exclusively nursing versus bottle feeding. Yeah, you know breast milk changes through the day, so the morning milk is has energizing ingredients and evening milk has uh, sleep inducing ingredients. So it's really important to make sure you're, if you're gonna um, pump to label your bottles or else you're gonna energize a night, uh, at nighttime a baby that's getting morning milk. Um, yeah, I, I probably would fall uh, in the line of nursing skin to skin from the breast instead of bottle feeding nursing. But if you have to do that because of work, 
that's okay. But if you have an option, I think it's better to go with the breast because the breast is always, it's a science laboratory. It's uh, modifying what's needed for that child in the moment. Uh, and the, uh, if you pump, there's no the saliva that's telling the breast what's needed, right? You must put saliva on the pump somehow of the baby. Um, yeah, so I would uh, always advocate for breast feeding instead of bottle milk, uh, breast bottle milk feeding. Can I add something to that? Yes, well? yes, yes. So we, we also do know there's been some scientific studies on just the mechanics are very different. Uh, bottle feeding versus breastfeeding. And so uh, just examining one variable within the infant is the vagus nerve. So that's the vagus nerve that uh, operates to calm and soothe um, the infant and all of us across the lifespan, that during breastfeeding, the mechanisms that the child, the infant is doing by um, sucking and swallowing and the way that they're moving the jaw is stimulating the vagus nerve in this perfect way that calms them. And so they have this parasympathetic wash, which is so relaxing, versus with the bottle feeding, it's more like gushing out. And so they're not using their moving those muscles in their face in the same way. And so that vagus nerve is not being stimulated in the same way. So yes, there are differences. And there's also some emerging ev evidence on epigenetic differences as well between breastfeeding and bottle feeding, because as Donna was saying, the skin to skin is so important. And so the way the skin to skin contact when you're breastfeeding, it is altering the way that certain genes are being turned on or off. And there's some interdisciplinary research showing that when moms 300 years ago or so went to work in the factories, they breastfed less and the jaws changed. So the skulls from 300 or so years ago have uh, better jaws, uh, wider uh, palates. And now we have narrower ones from uh, the lack of lengthy breastfeeding, and that leads to sleep problems and uh, various other problems as well. Off, you need orthodontics, for example. There's, um, there was just, I, I think, a follow-up. Oh. oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I think there was just a follow-up comment about um, from Mallory. Um, my two-year-old's pediatrician told me today, don't show kids you care too much or they'll purposely push your buttons. He truly thinks he's an expert on child development. <laughs> I think moms can help educate. <laughs> but I also had to accept that they do not have the training, unfortunately. Yeah, well, if you've let, let your child, uh, uh, if you've made them scream to get your attention when they're little, when they're a baby, then they will be a tantrum-y kind of child, right? Because you've made them learn that they have to scream and push your buttons to get attention, right? But if you just meet their needs by watching their face and their gestures and their, they start to make a face, well then change something, you know, pat them or rock them. They need a lot of rocking for good digestion. And they expect it because we spent, what, 6 million years of our history walking around a lot. And now we're just sitting most of the time, right? That's weird for the baby's brain development. So they need lots of rocking and get a rocking chair. Uh, and it's um, going to help them with brain development and with digestion. Oh, I, there was another one here. Um, the colicky baby. Yeah. So that someone asked, is that, would that been in the ancestral past? Nope. It would have eaten, been eaten by the predators, right? So our babies uh, in, in our ancestral context, that means hunter gatherers. We talk about this in a lot of different uh, videos and podcasts and essays. So you can find out more didn't have time today. Um, Macaulay, um, meaning that they're crying regularly. There's no cr real crying in these societies because the baby's pretty much carried all the time, which grows the brain properly and all the self-regulation capacities of various kinds. And <clears throat> they uh, today, the colicky, there's, it's sort of an outcome. It's sort of like autism. There's a lot of causes for these outcomes. And, and that's true for, for colic too. So it could be that they're not being carried enough generally, uh, or the, which helps with breathing. Again, the breathing is so important. And so they cry to, because the crying helps you breathe better. <laughs> 
and then young babies, uh, uh, Jim McKenna has a theory that they can't stop crying once they start because uh, they don't have the mechanism yet uh, to stop. So, you, so in these ancestral contexts, if a baby starts to cry, they pick up, pick up the baby, pick up the baby, right? Because they somehow know that if you let them keep going, they can't stop, right? But we sort of forgot that. We think, oh, it's normal for babies to cry. Uh, and then um, there can be interference in the microbiome so that a lot of pain is happening because they got sugar water in the hospital. So that's a baby unfriendly hospital then if they gave sugar water or formula for no medical reason or vaccines can do this too. And formula in general is indigestible for a baby. It's cow milk, cow mother's milk, not human milk. Mary. Yeah, sorry, I was monitoring the chat, so. Oh, I thought you were <laughs> waving at me. <laughs> okay. So I think we're coming around 1.15. Um, if anyone, if anyone would has any other follow-up questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but I think we can start to wrap up. Um, and I can also share, um, I think I can probably prepare something with, with some of the, some of Darsha's responses to some of the questions that we didn't get to, if that's okay. Um, we will be um, making Mary, this recording. Books? Oops, sorry. Do we have another question? Mary just Mary, could you put the books in the, there's some books, some people were asking about what could I read, you know, or, or what resources attached at the heart. And I can also, I'm going to, I was going to send out um, a post event uh, questionnaire just to see kind of what things people might be interested in in the future. So I can list everything that you've seen in the chat today. Um, and then, you know, links to Darsha's work, um, her articles and books as well. Um, and I will the put, PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to put also my, the email address you can use. Uh, I'll send you the PowerPoint as a PDF. Perfect. Maybe. And so we can make all of these materials available to you. Um, if anyone has any specific questions, they think of something else they want, um, please send an email to the email address in the chat. Um, but otherwise you will be getting access to where to go to find this talk, where to, um, we'll send the PowerPoint slides and then links um, for everything that was mentioned today. Um, and if there's anything else on top of that that you'd like to see included, um, please just let me know. Another book, uh, here's the Sweet Sleep, which is La Leche League. Uh, Mary just put a link there. And there's another one attached to the heart, which is uh, also very helpful from Amer uh, Attachment Parenting International. So thank you so much um, to everyone for joining us. Um, I hope we can keep disseminating this really valuable information um, to get it to the ears and eyes that it needs to arrive to. And thank you so much, um, Darsha, for imparting your knowledge on us and your expertise and, and Mary as well. Um, it, was, it was a truly wonderful experience to be in this with all of you. So well, thank, thank you for having me and thanks for putting up with all my <gasps> soapbox passion. <laughs> no, I mean, we need, to, we need it, we're soaking it in. Um, Christy's asking, thank you, thank you. yes, well, so the recording will be posting on where will, which site will it be on, Darsha? It'll be at Evolve Nest. Okay, so we'll, you will have, if you are registered for this event, um, then you'll be getting another email with where to look out for the, for the link to the recording. And then you'll also get the PowerPoint slides. Um, so, yeah, so, and if I don't you, have, oh, go ahead. If we, if you wait a few days, then we'll get the video up and you can send the link. Okay, I'll do it that way. Um, and yeah, so if you weren't, if you are, if you have had the Zoom link some other way and weren't registered because I have all the registrations, all the email addresses within the registration. So if, if you don't think I have it that way, just let me know so that I can make sure to add you to a list so that you can get everything. Um, but otherwise, hopefully um, we will be organizing more events like this um, and we hope that you can join us again. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, Megan.